So I'd say in the last 15 years, there would have been you know, two genuine, what I would class as M&A super cycles. The one, first one was sort of leading into uh, the GFC, uh, when that obviously uh, the, the global financial crisis really you know, ceased that M&A super cycle. And then the most recent one I'd say sort of started you know, at the end of 2020 and is really just getting going. And we're seeing M&A activity at heightened levels now for a few, for a few reasons. Uh, firstly, there's a real backlog of M&A transactions that would have normally happened during calendar 2020 that did not happen. And that's for good reason because companies and boards were very focused on the global health pandemic as they should quite rightly have been. Uh, secondly, the cost of capital you know, is very, very cheap. The risk-free rate, the 10-year US Treasury um, rate is you know, uh, close to all-time lows. So the cost of capital and access to equ equity capital as well is, uh, is readily available and at, at a cheap, cheap, cheap cost. Um, this change, change creates a need for boards to do things. And in terms of, um, there's been an acceleration of a lot of trends, be it if you're a retailer through online shopping as a result of the pandemic, online shopping and e-commerce was already here, but the speed and rollout of it has been accelerated. Um, and then, then finally, it's really about um, business confidence. Boards have come from a very you know, low level of business confidence and as the world starts to open up and there's a vaccine rollout um, with proven high levels of efficacy, uh, you know, boards are becoming more confident as to what you know, living with COVID may well look like. I think monetary or fiscal shocks often um, you know, are a predecessor to you know, causing M&A cycles to, to end. A uh, significant ri rise in the risk-free rate is something which would increase the overall weighted cost of capital, which might um, you know, you know, be a, a precursor to that M&A super cycle uh, finishing. It could be um, a, a macro uh, you know, shock such as um, you know, if there's any tensions between countries in, in various parts of the world. So anything that goes to influencing confidence in a, in a in boardroom confidence in a negative way. Boardrooms don't like uncertainty and anything contributing to uncertainty can um, undo you know, the trend of an MA super cycle. In terms of for the stocks to enter the portfolio, because that will influence um, our thinking when to exit, they need to get through three gates. Gate one is value, gate two is quality, and then the third gate is for the stock to have one or more catalysts. And it's that third gate, the catalyst gate, which will accelerate the, you know, and, and, and bring forward the type of private equity returns from the publicly listed markets um, from this fund. So in terms of when a stock is deemed appropriate to exit, it's very much dependent upon those catalysts having been enacted. Once those catalysts have been enacted, um, you know, the, the real private equity type returns from the stock would have been realised. And it's at that point that we'll look to, you know, exit the stock. Alternatively, if the catalyst has not um, been achieved for some particular reason, you know, it's at that point in time that we may look to exit the stock. But it's all with regard to what we, you know, deem to be fair value for the stock relative um, to its future pro prospects and the market at large. We typically exit the stock in the entirety for a couple of reasons. Firstly, once we once the stock has achieved what we deem to be fair value, you know, it's appropriate to be um, exited at that point in time. But also, we are of course limited in the number of total stocks that may uh, form as part of the catalyst portfolio. So if we you know, gradually exit stocks over a long period of time, it limits our ability to exit one position to enter another position you know, simultaneously.